All right. Um, Seven. Assalamualaikum and very good morning. So today will be our second last lecture. Uh, I mean, last lecture. So hopefully on Thursday, what we're gonna do is basically looking at um some sample questions that I'm gonna prepare tomorrow. Um, and hopefully as long as you can answer those questions, it will pretty much reflect back on your on the final exam. Okay. All right, so how many? 35, 37, minus 3, 35, 34. Half of the class. So I'm hoping that the other half, which are not here, you guys are doing your assignment. <laughs> this is going to do um, in the next few days. Okay, so this is where we are at. I'm um, going to cover just a little bit on um, analgesic, probably about half an hour or so. And then the remaining of the time, I'm going to show you a little bit on how to use Pymol. Um, since you do have enough time to actually try and improve it a little bit. Okay. And then on Thursday, we're going to do a bit of tutorial. So I highly encourage you to actually come. Why? Because I will not going to record it. Okay. So the tutorial will not be recorded. So if you are here, then you'll see the questions. If you're not here, then too bad for you. Okay. Um, and of course, especially because 38 is so close to Raya. So, um, you know, I need to sacrifice my Raya. So you need to sacrifice it as well, even though you are at home. Okay. So, so just recap on what we've did. Um, for the past few weeks, we've looked at the history of uh, anesthetics and analgesia. We've looked at a little bit of classification. We've also looked at um, some pathways, um, inflammatory pathway um, and non-inflammatory pathways um, via neurons. Okay, so we're gonna, what we're going to look at today is more on the, um, the other side of pain relief. So the first one is uh, via nociceptor. Okay, so it's, it's a receptor, either a chemical receptor, um, temperature receptor or more pressure receptor or sense receptor. From there, uh, depending on the stimuli, um, you can get neurons to actually transfer or try or transmit the pain um, signals to your brain to process it as a pain. And we've looked at how morphine um, pretty much blocks or what do you call it, um, the receptor pathways. Okay, so today we're going to look at is uh, looking at the other side of pain. Okay, so the chapter, as I mentioned, um, and the second what we're going to look at today is on um, inflammation. So the network over today is a bit slow, so you might not want to see what I'm writing. Okay, so this is what we're going to look at today. Um, there's, again, a lot of pathways um, because we are complex being and complex being has complex system. Complex system has complex pathways. So from here, what you can see, these are all the stimuli, um, or stim stimulus, I would say, that's plural. Okay, so those are, on top of that, there's uh, all the stimuli or stimulus um, that can, towards the end of the day, result in inflammation. And inflammation, as you will see in the next few slides, can actually lead to uh, pain, okay? Um, and this is what normally most of us are um, exposed to. So like if you have a stomach pain, normally it's from inflammation. Of course, it could also be from a bacterial infection. Um, but the other things, if you have rashes, for example, so it is also an inflammation. Um, uh, if you have pimples, for example, it can cause inflammation. Um, if you cough too much, um, it can also cause inflammation, of course. Um, the system is not isolated, meaning that um, the nociceptors and the inflammation 
uh, pathway can actually occur at uh, at the same time okay so just to touch a little bit um il here stands for interleukin it's part of um, our body's signaling pathways so um and you can see here there's so many things that uh, p is phosphorylation so pretty much um you can target a lot of these things so anything in the middle here that can potentially be a target for drug design okay um pumps and and uh, dams are receptors that recognizes um, specific structures on uh, microbes okay bacteria for example okay um what else so that one is again them pumps and we can also detect oxidative stress if you have radicals for example uh, radiation causing radicals from radicals there's a lot of cascades of um, signaling and then you can actually block okay so that one is a sign of for blocking so um oxidative stress actually blocks inflammation uh, but you know it's not what we are going to look at today okay so suffice to um, again know that there are myriads of um, responses that can lead to inflammation um, and this inflammation not just going to cause pain but the pain itself is also a signal uh, to tell your body that there is a foreign object something is wrong so initiate cellular defense and part of it, um, for example, for vaccines is antibody. So that's why once you had, um, I'm sure most of you had at least like a little bit of either headache or slight fever. So fever is also caused by inflammation down the line, of course. Okay. And then from the fever itself, your body uh, develops a protection and thus producing antibodies. Okay. So um, these are pretty much the kind of like pathway. Um, again, it's not very, very detailed, even though you probably look at it and say, oh, it's very detailed, but technically it's not um, because there's so many receptors that can actually lead to this. So number one, there is the source of the stimuli. So it can either be irritants, a chemical stimuli or pumps, which are a receptor that causing the signals. Okay, and from number one, goes back to number two. Number two here is where, remember, I think last week I mentioned about uh, arachinoidic acid uh, as part of the very complex um, receptor pathways between neurons. Okay, so this is where um, AA is very important because AA is part of the, um, I would say, chemicals or biological uh, molecules that is critical for um, PGE2 or um, this receptor recognition um, and thus leads to inflammation. Okay, so this, this is part of the uh, pathways. Of course, there are other effects that you can see here, but nonetheless, um, it is one of the main ingredient that leads to this effect. Okay, and this one is the pain. Uh, which will cause pain or irritation and stuff like that, okay? So if you go, this, this one is very specific, it goes under that way over there, okay? So it says here, um, okay, one thing to note is that the AA comes from uh, your phospholipid bilayer. So remember your cell has an outer membrane, okay? And that's the only membrane that it has, an inner membrane from the other organelles. Um, but the outer membrane, once it is damaged, it produces um, in the presence of um, phospholipase A, will produce uh, AA, okay? And then this AA will kind of like signals that there is a damage, um, cause inflammation, and, you know, in, and inflammation is actually not bad because it is part of um, how our body signals about so to kind of like tell us something is wrong to your body, so either do something or tell the other cells in the body to help us, okay? So that's that's kind of like a signal. So from there, um, so that's why it says here, skin cells, for example, if you punch it your um, arms, okay? So it will definitely be um, cell damage, cell damage, uh, pretty much it's kind of like telling you that there's a membrane damage, membrane damage produces AA, 
AA will go under path, uh, COX-1 or COX-2, um, enzyme, and then towards the end of the day, we'll activate either of these two receptors or probably both at the same time and thus causing inflammation. Okay, So that's where PGE2 comes in. It's from there, and there's a lot of, again, cascades, and then all this cascade either releasing histamine. Uh, histamine is what causing uh, rashes. Okay, and uh, degranulation of either uh, other um, chemoreceptors that will cause uh, inflammation, and either also include uh, increase vascular permeability so that white cells can actually passes through between cells or between layers of cells e uh, easier, or the nucleus will produce interleukin six, which um, towards the end of the day will increase the recruitment of leukocyte. So leukocyte is one of our, I think you, everybody learned this in biology during high school. It's one of our white blood cells um, types. Okay, so we have multiple types. Leukocyte is one of them. Okay, so where am I going with this? Um, that one is just Cox. Okay, cyclooxygenase part three. So where am I going with this? Uh, we will see in the next slide. So this is again uh, just to show you what are the uh, what are the effects um, that can happen in the presence of AA. Okay, again, AA signals. So there's actually a very complex thing about how AA uh, actually relates back to uh, prostaglandins and uh, thromboxane. Uh, but if you are interested, then you can you can dig in, dig into it. But um, it's not part of your learning progress. So what's important is AA uh, COX-2 or COX-1, and then from there, you can actually see um, COX-1, the effects is at a slightly different uh, location than COX-2, and then each of it has its own um, long-term, either short-term or long-term effects, okay? So say, for example, if you damage your skin, um, there's a bleeding, so most likely it will go through COX-1, uh, where you can actually see this all tissue uh, so far, Okay, so, so far, all tissue can actually activate this pathway. Okay, and then to the end of the day, it depends on whether it will go into thromboxane or uh, prostaglandins uh, path. So, in case of bleeding, most likely it will go under here because it increases platelet aggregation. So, you want to stop your bleeding. Okay, so you will go in the path, that path and then you increase vascular constriction whereby your blood vessels constricts uh, and thus lower blood flow. Okay, so you reduce bleeding. So that's you know, part of the um, effects. So um, this is where the um, drugs come in, or what we call the drug is uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs. Okay. Um, why do we call it non-steroidal? Because if you look at the structure of opioids, they kind of like resembles steroids a little bit. And um, of course, steroids can also reduce inflammation, uh, but we do not cover steroids on this lecture. I'm not sure whether you guys learn it somewhere else, but nonetheless, steroids can also be an anti-inflammation. But on the other hand, steroids also can increase dependency or addiction. But uh, NSAIDs do not do that because they are non-steroidal. So that is the main advantage of uh, NSAID. So it acts on COX-1 receptor, uh, which is the key enzyme in uh, prostanoid synthesis, which we've seen previously uh, is one of the pathway that will lead to inflammation. Okay, So an inflammation will cause pain. So if you block COX-1, uh, pretty much you block the uh, synthesis of prostanoids, so you block inflammation and therefore you block the pain, okay, feeling of pain. So examples of this category of drugs are pretty much the ones that you've seen previously and the one that I mentioned, you have paracetamol, ibuprofen, aspirin, um, the famous one, and you have the other ones which are relatively um, not famous, but they still use in some hospitals. Okay. So COX-1 COX was found in blood vessels, intestinal, blah, blah, blah. As I mentioned, all the cells. And COX-2 is predominantly in um, 
parenchymal cells of many tissue with few exceptions, for example, the heart. So the heart doesn't have any COX-2, it's mostly COX-1. All right, so um, this is just to show you how inhibitors or drugs um, actually goes into uh, or blocks COX-1 or COX-2. Um, I do have a PDB image if you want to have a look at it. Um, otherwise, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys what you can actually do in PyMole a little bit so that for those who have not completed your assignment, perhaps it will help you in one way or another. Let me see. Um, entire window. Share now. Okay, so what I have here, a bit small. Am I? I hope you can see because I'm actually recording this section. Okay, so what you can do is um, if you actually open one of the other two um, uh, PDB files that I mentioned, there's actually a very huge file. So you already know how to um, make it smaller by just selecting and then you can just go select and then remove. Okay. But what I want to show you now is something slightly more different. Okay. So you can see here the axis rotation is kind of like at the center of the protein, right? So what you can do is actually, um, if say you want it to rotate uh, around your inhibitor, so what you do is you, you can just click on your inhibitor, which I did manage to click. Okay, so click on your drug. You can go into selection uh, because now it's selecting your molecule. Go to A. You can actually go and do center so that it will center on the uh, molecule itself. And then you can go into origin. So once you do that, what will happen is the center of rotation will go around, um, go about your molecule. Okay. So why is this important? Because now you can actually uh, look at your molecule and perhaps the interaction of the molecule better. Now, that's one thing. Second thing, uh, if you have explored what you can do uh, in drug design, that's the purpose why I have not shown this in the very, very beginning, because otherwise you guys just follow instruction so instead of exploring, is that you can actually do modify around uh, atom within 4 m strong or 5 m strong 6 or whatever you want. Okay, so m strong is pretty much size, right? 10 to the power of 10 uh, meters. Okay, so what it will do is you can you can actually go and select the molecule or, or atoms or amino acids around your molecule. So from here, I can actually say um, rather confidently that these amino acids that are currently highlighted are the amino acid that has the strongest interaction with my molecule. So similarly, in your own um, design, you can actually look at this and see which are the amino acid that plays an important role in your binding. So from there, you can actually um, do many other things. For example, you can duplicate the selection so that, you know, you don't have to each time go and click your molecule and then from your molecule, you go and select blah, blah, blah. So what you can do is since I've already duplicated that one, so this will always select the molecule around my um, inhibitor. So from there, you can either play around with the colors or you can do something like um, a surface. So from this surface, what you can see is pretty much uh, interaction between your molecule and um, the receptor. Okay, so just adjust it a little bit. using keypad. But at least now you can see the molecule. For example, um, this benzyl ring from a phenol-like structure. Okay. So red is normally the color for oxygen. Um, blue is normally the color for nitrogen. And then green is just for carbon. And then you might see um, protons, if I have any. Okay, uh, We have one proton there. You can see that small bit there. That one is a proton. And this one over here, even though it's white, but it's not proton, that one is a fluorine. And this is a special for this particular inhibitor. Okay, 
and all this information can actually be found in the uh, PDB information. Now, what's important here is that you can actually see the interaction. For example, this one is more on hydrophobic, okay, because that one is green. And then it's kind of like range or closely together with another green. So, you know, if it's green and green, then there's nothing else. We can either have, uh, so you can call it pi to sigma bond, van der Waals, and the dispersion force, and stuff like that, okay? Similarly, if you see um, kind of like that one, okay, so there's red and then red. So this one is most likely um, um, hydrogen bond, most likely, it could not be. Uh, you need to investigate because I did not show any protons from the um, receptor itself. But most likely, if you do see something like this, this is hydrogen bond. So from here, you can actually kind of like tell um, that your molecule fit nicely, there's a lot of interaction. And from here, you can actually predict, uh, we can already predict what are the uh, functional groups that is important for um, your receptor interaction. Okay, so like, for example, that one, you can see clearly see red and um, blue. Okay, so most likely that one is hydrogen uh, bonding. So if I were to remove um, or change the, the nitrogen to simply carbon, it will definitely break the hydrogen bond and hydrogen bond is one of the bond, uh, important bonds in, uh, in, in uh, molecule interaction or, or biomolecular interaction. And if you break hydrogen bond and simply switch it to uh, dispersion force, then you know that the interaction now becomes weaker. So if the interaction becomes weaker, then you can expect your, if you were to do another binding or by just switching the nitrogen to a carbon, then you can predict, uh, well, simply the um, uh, binding affinity will uh, increase. Okay, not decrease, but increase. Okay, so that's one way to do it. And that's one way you can use to actually explain in your um, report. Okay, so it's not just simply um, just do it and then use the value and then um, report this and that. But what I want you guys to do is, again, looking at structure activity relationship. So that is more important. Okay, what else can you do here? Um, you can, yeah, interaction. Um, and, and perhaps if you want to see, I uh, mentioned here green and green interaction, right? So if you want to know what is the um, particular residue for that particular region, okay? Because so, now you have no idea and if you try to click it, it will not show anything, okay? So how can you identify? by doing this. So you can actually click on the ones down here. Okay, you can change, you can change it to atoms. So that what you can do is now you can actually select an atom. Okay, and then again, once you have selected your atom, you can go back to um, A or action, modify around for Armstrong to find the corresponding um, uh, atoms related to this. Okay. And then from here, you can either just mark it, color it blue, so that all the selected sequences now it's in blue color. And then from there, you can just simply go around and try and find more blue. So GA is down there, but up here, what is it? Um, is there any other blue here? Oh, probably I need to change it to receptor. No way. Do it again, so you can select okay, all modify around 5M strong, change it to residue, then you can try and color it. Okay, um, one of the residues selected but not colored, it must be that one. Okay, so you can see um, if now, when, when I'm selecting L over here, even though it's not blue, uh, but it was blue initially, then you can see the um, leucine, if you want to show it, then you can actually see, is it leucine or something else? Oh yeah, it is leucine. Okay, so it's leucine having that particular green color that has the interaction between this uh, pi bond and um, leucine. So if it's leucine, then most likely a uh, uh, dispersion force. 
Okay, so I think that's it um, for me to show you guys. Let's move back to our lecture. Okay. sharing okay all right so that's one example and you can actually do this for your molecule um, and you can see whether it's hydrogen bonding as i mentioned uh when the walls pi, pi, pi alkyl pi pi and all the other interactions that exist in chemistry okay now um moving back to the um analgesic so we know that it blocks COX-1 receptor, but how does it actually uh, block the receptor? So the key enzyme in uh, postanoid synthesis is COX-1, okay? And what it will do is from phospholipid, um, you do have, uh, what was the enzyme and just now? This one enzyme that converts phospholipids into uh, arachidonic acid, and then arachidonic acid actually move in into COX-1 and then uh, there's a catalytic site over there that converts arachidonic acid into PGH2 and then PGH2 will either go into uh, these other two enzyme and this one is the PEXO something um, pathway and this is the uh, pathway that particularly um, involves in inflammation. Okay, so if arachidonic acid cannot enter the active site of the receptor therefore this pgh2 will not be produced and thus um, all the other downstream pathway will also be blocked okay so nsaid what it does is um, there's two options okay um, so far that was identified so one is um, it blocks excess to the active site, so excess of um, AA to the active site. Okay, so if AA cannot go into the active site, uh, it will not be catalyzed, and thus you again you will just stop the whole process. Or we aspirin on, for example, what it does is instead of um, directly blocking the active site, um, what it does is there's a serine residue nearby the active site. And if you look at the structure of serine down here, you have an ester bond, which is um, not too strong, but neither too weak. Okay, but nonetheless, it's one of the weakest bond. And aspirin can actually enter this um, the, the region of the active site. And instead of directly blocking the catalytic site, what it does, it, it actually um, acetylate another residue uh, serine residue nearby so that to the other day even though arachidonic acid can actually enter the particular area but because of steric hindrance uh, it can no longer reach the catalytic site thus blocking the um, pathway altogether okay so this is what uh, aspirin is doing nonetheless we uh, i did mention about the other uh, nsaids and from here i've dig out try and find as much information that I can. And uh, these are all mode of action that uh, was reported. So aspirin, you can actually inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2, not just COX-1. Um, how acetylation at near active site. So as I've previously mentioned in the previous slide. Okay, Paracetamol, on the other hand, is a bit more interesting because uh, even though it was discovered in 1878, it was not until around 19, was it 1950s that paracetamol is actually being used. Okay. However, even though there's more than 70 years um, uh, since the use, first use of paracetamol, its mode of action is still um, under um, undetermined. Okay. So there's multiple pathways being proposed, multiple uh, experiments that have been done, but there is no kind of like clear instruction uh, or clear mode of action um, so yeah it's it's kind of like very interesting and because it's a very old drug and it works uh, thus the usage is still allowed okay in contrast to um, some other drugs for example uh, vaccines um, vaccines that utilizes uh, aluminium can no longer be used 
pathway because um, the pathway is again unknown um, but uh, nonetheless BCG uh, contains aluminium is still being used. So the path of drugs administration, how they are doing it is that if it works, don't fix it. Okay, so that's that's pretty much it. Um, and then if you go to the next one, uh, ibuprofen, again, it's COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitor, but instead of um, doing any acetylation or acylation or a different um, blocking, sterically blocking at the different site, okay, um, what it does, it, it actually bound to the active site. So it goes around, block the active site, block the catalytic site. Uh, therefore, AA cannot enter. Again, um, there's no interaction between AA and the uh, COX uh, enzyme and therefore no activity. Okay, So these are what we call as competitive inhibitor because it's now competing with the same um, ligand. Okay, so COX ligand is AA uh, and test ibuprofen because it kind of like bound in the same active site. So we call it competitive. So non-competitive is where you have um, aspirin, for example, it doesn't really react on the active site. So it's blocked part of the active site, but it does not really kind of like interact with the uh, catalytic active site. Uh, similarly, um, dicofenac uh, also bound at the active site and we have uh, the other one indomethacin uh, also bound to the active site. So and you can see the structure are rather similar where that particular um, structural type uh, more or less um, can be observed in um, all molecules. So this one is oh, around that one and this one is something there. Okay, So you can always see um, drugs having similar mode of action normally has similar um, skeleton. Okay, and last one is an ex looking at the structure activity relationship of an aspirin. Um, I was thinking of doing paracetamol initially, but then digging through paracetamol information, I cannot find a conclusive mode of action. And therefore, if there's no mode of action, there's no clear instruction or, or clear uh, information on the structure activity relationship. So aspirin over here, um, there are some modification changing from auto to meta. Okay, so now it's auto. Okay, if you change it to a meta from here, so you will decrease the activity. So you know, know that there could be some interaction uh, between this um, carboxylic acid and the uh, some residues near the serine. Okay, because towards the end of the day, when you have a serine like this, if you want to acetylate it, you need to make sure that the serine is freely accessible to this particular um, region. So this most likely has some hydrogen bonding somewhere near so that uh, it allows serine to actually interact uh, with aspirin and thus uh, catalyzing the reaction. Okay, and people also try to cyclize uh, this structure itself. You can see um, this two can very, very easily be cyclized. So they, they tried to cyclize this. Um, forming two acetyl benzoic acid, it decreases the activity. Um, but if they cyclize it in three methyl uh, uh, pertalidide, it actually increases the activity. But nonetheless, um, if the structure itself works, because aspirin, uh, I'm not sure you guys have the experience. I don't think you did any aspirin synthesis in the lab. But looking at the structure, it's fairly easy to actually synthesize an aspirin. Um, even though this particular structure increase, uh, increases the activity, however, uh, now you need to have additional um, synthesis steps to produce the molecule. So that's why aspirin stop as an aspirin. Um, people might still synthesize a derivative, but nonetheless, um, if it works, why bother to change to a different one if it's only increase in a slight activity. Okay, increase in chain. Uh, if you switch it to to two propionyl benzoic acid, so pretty much I think it increases this length. Okay, 
So the activity is similar to aspirin. So towards the end of the day, um, as long as this uh, esterbone can actually be uh, cleave off and link to serine, then you pretty much have the same activity. Okay. I think that is all. Um, summary, what we have done so far is, uh, or was, we've, we've looked at the mechanism of action of multiple drugs. You look at opioids. You looked at uh, and SAIDs um, and some other drugs. Unfortunately, we were not able to cover on the vaccination due to time constraint, but um, nonetheless, you know, it's better than nothing. We also look at structure activity relationship of multiple molecules. We look at um, ligand receptor interaction, which is pretty much the uh, main uh, reason looking at the drug efficacy nowadays. Okay. So we also do know a direct uh, inhibition, you call it a competitive, indirect inhibition, you can call it non-competitive. But if you go into a more higher level of drug design and whatnot, they are actually in other three different categories of non-competitive. Okay, uh, we're not going to cover about it here. Um, if I can't remember whether that cost, I'll be teaching it, I will be still teaching it next semester or not. Okay, and the best thing is you have designed your own drug candidates and now we are ready to become a, a medicinal chemist if you would like to. Okay, so that's all from me. Um, thank you and um, if you do have any questions, you can ask me now. And again, a gentle reminder that next week or not next week, next Thursday, our last session, we will have a tutorial um, and session will not be recorded. Because what I like to do is sometimes I will just recycle the question for a quiz for a different course. Okay, so uh, I don't want it to be online. Okay, um, <laughs> nobody sees that except for you guys. <laughs> all right, that's all from me. Thank you. Have a good day. Selamat hari raya. Um, oh, wait, we already have another session on Thursday, so I'll wish you again next Thursday. Thank you, guys. Stay safe. Thank you, Doctor. Ni boleh tengok juga siapa yang tak ada. Siapa yang tak mendengar. Ha. Siapa yang tak keluar lagi tu, dia tak dengar lagi tu. Up to you guys lah. Saya ada je dekat sini sebab saya balik semenyih je. Ha.